Good morning. Welcome on this first Sunday after the Epiphany. Epiphany is, is generally accepted as the last day of the 12 days of Christmas. That was two days ago. The first Sunday after Epiphany is always the day that we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, which gives us an opportunity to think about something that we don't think about very often, and that is our baptisms. So today we will have a remembrance of our baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave his church the command to baptize when he said in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Scripture makes plain the universal need for baptism. As children of Adam, we belong to a fallen race. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature and would be lost forever unless delivered by our Lord Jesus Christ. He willingly took on himself the curse of sin and by his death on the cross, redeemed us and all people. Christ's almighty word gives baptism its power to save. Peter declares, baptism now saves you. Scripture also clearly teaches that the power and promise of baptism is intended for young and old alike. On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter testified, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. By water and the Spirit, we are born again and united with Christ and his people as members of the church. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the water of baptism you forgave my sins and delivered me from death and the devil. You raised me to a new life in Christ and clothed me with his perfection and holiness. Help me to rejoice in your washing of salvation and live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapter 36, beginning at verse 24. If I asked any of our confirmation students this morning what the word baptism means, do you know what you would say? What does the word baptize mean? I'm looking at all of you who are looking down into your laps right now. Remember, we have a test this Wednesday on baptism and the Lord's Supper. Anybody? Baptize simply? Thank you. Nobody told you that? The word baptize in the Greek simply means to apply water in, in any way. And, and, and God takes that word baptize and he says, not only am I going to use this for washing of, of people and, and cups and kettles and pots, but he says, I'm going to take this and make it a, a, a much better word. And he uses now, with the power of God's word, this is something that washes away not dirt from the body, but sin from our souls. We read from Ezekiel chapter 36. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. This is the word of our God. The, word of our God. the second lesson take, is taken from the book of Titus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is God's word. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. 
But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Grace and mercy and peace belong to you from Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. Amen. Our text for this morning on this baptism of our Lord is the account of the baptism of our Lord from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. We read it before. We'll focus on those verses before us this morning. Dear brothers and dear sisters, in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who was baptized for a, a very specific reason. Does anybody know what happened two months ago today? Do you remember what happened two months ago today? It was a Tuesday. Election day. Two months ago today, November 8th, <clears throat> Donald Trump was elected and he became one of the most unanticipated, one of the most unlikely next presidents of the United States of America. Nobody had guessed that he would actually win that particular election. Political pundits ever since, editorial writers ever since, have been scratching their heads wondering how in the world did he pull it off. And, and, and they're still not convinced that, that this is the way that he did it. There's all kinds of theories as to how he pulled off this particular election. As a matter of fact, we get the paper, we get the Sunday paper at our house, just the Sunday paper. Every single Sunday paper in the editorial section, there's been at least two, three, four different editorials from experts in the field, political pundits, saying, you know, I'm not sure exactly how, but this is how I think it happened. And you know what the general consensus is of how Donald Trump became the president-elect of the United States? came down to this, at least this is what, what my, my take is on it from all the other editorial writers that I've been reading. Donald Trump <clears throat> was the one person that the normal, average, everyday, blue-collar American thought would fight for him or her better than Hillary Clinton. And, and, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Because we all like people that want to fight for us. We elect people that will go to Madison or will go to Washington, D.C., who will fight for us, be our representative. That's what the word means. They will represent us in a, a greater field. And, and so the average, everyday, blue-collar American finally came down to this. I think that Donald Trump is going to fight for me more so than Hillary Clinton. Now, it might not seem like this from the first five verses of our text, those short verses of our text this morning. But that's exactly what we see happening in our text for this morning. Two short weeks ago, we rejoiced at Jesus' birth on this particular day. Last Sunday, we rejoiced at the name of Jesus, Jesus meaning Savior from our sins. And today we see Jesus starting, embarking on his crusade, his mission to save us, to fight for us, not just for our bodies, not just for our lives, but for our very souls and our eternity in heaven. And so that's what we're going to focus on this morning, Jesus fighting for our souls through his beginning of his baptism. Our text begins with a, a, a little discussion, and it seems like it's little more than just a little discussion between John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus had traveled down from Galilee in the north, and he had now made it outside of Jerusalem to the Jordan River, <clears throat> to the place where John the Baptist had been setting up camp and baptizing and preaching a baptism of repentance. John the Baptist sees Jesus in line getting ready to come into the Jordan River to be baptized, and it just didn't seem right to John the Baptist. Not just because it was a relative of, of him, but it didn't seem like Jesus needed to be baptized. And so our text tells us that John tried to deter Jesus from coming down into the water. He said this, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? 
Now we know very well why John tried to deter Jesus from becoming baptized. Because John, for who knows how long, had been baptizing sinners. He had been baptizing prostitutes. He had been baptizing tax collectors. He had been, he had been baptizing sinners of every sort, every flavor. Why? For the forgiveness of their sins. They needed the forgiveness of sins. And so when John sees Jesus coming down into the Jordan River to be baptized, this holy son of God, no sin, no shame, no skeletons in his closet, no scandalous life in the past, he doesn't see why Jesus needs to be baptized. And so he says, no, I don't want to do it. Imagine a, a completely healthy adult. No problems, no health issues, calling up the oncology department at your local hospital and saying, I want to make an appointment. I want to have a chemotherapy regimen scheduled for, or maybe I need a bone marrow transplant. He walks into the oncology department and, and the doctor sees that person and says, when were you diagnosed and, and can you tell me what kind of cancer you have? And the patient says, I don't have cancer. I just want some chemotherapy. I just want a bone marrow transplant. Can I just have a bone marrow transplant? And the doctor looks at the person and says, what are you talking about? He says, that's going to harm you. Don't you understand that that's going to harm your body, the cells in your body? It's going to be painful, all kinds of side effects from, from the treatment. You don't need a cancer treatment. You don't have any cancer. Same thing happened with Jesus. Jesus walks down from Galilee into the Jordan River to be baptized by John. And John says, what are you doing? You don't need to be baptized. You don't have any sin to be baptized from. You know if anything, it might hurt you. You know how it is when sometimes there are people in your life that you would want to be seen with, but there are also some people in your life that you would say, yeah, I don't know if I want to be seen with that kind of person. I don't want to be caught in a picture with that kind of person and put that picture on the front of the paper. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus if he would have actually gone through with this baptism, John would be thinking he would be identifying with sinners of the worst kind. Everyday sinners, yes, but sinners of every kind. To which Jesus says, that's what I want. I want to be identified with everybody on the face of this earth. And that's why he goes on and says, let it be so now. It's kind of a, a nice way of saying, no, John, you might not want to baptize me, but you will baptize me right now. He says, let it be so now, for it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. He doesn't just tell John to let it go, John, but he commands, no, you will baptize me. As Jesus says... He gives the reason, to fulfill all righteousness. Now, how would Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River fulfill all righteousness? Because by taking their place, Jesus was going to identify with you and me. And that's exactly what he needed to do. He's not just saying that he's the friend of sinners. He's not just going to say that he's going to stick up for sinners or that he's on the side of sinners. By his baptism, he is actually saying, I am becoming the sinner. Why? Because the one who was sinless needed to become us, our substitute, to go to the cross to take care of those sins and get rid of them once and for all by dying on the cross. Re remember how he came to save us from sin? He became a human being. Down from heaven into this earth, on the cross, God condemned not you and me for their sins. He condemned Jesus for, their, for our sins. In our place, Jesus takes the full brunt of the punishment that we deserve because of our sins, even to the point of his own death on the cross. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Spartacus. I, I like old movies once in a while. The, the, the movie Spartacus, I'm not even sure when it was, but it had the old Douglas, not Michael Douglas, but Kirk Douglas, the old, old guy. He, he was this Roman slave who had been captured. He fought for his freedom. Now he leads a whole slave revolt, revolt in the, the area of Rome. Eventually, the end of the movie, the slaves are captured. A lot of them are massacred and slaughtered. And they're in chains waiting for their judgment. They know what it's rumored 
happened to them. They were going to be crucified because of their rebellion against the Roman Empire. But as they're sitting, waiting for the general to pronounce the judgment, the general says this. He says, nobody will be crucified as long as this one condition is fulfilled. You identify which one of you is Spartacus. We want the leader. Whether he's dead on the battlefield back there, identify him. If he's still living among you, you show us where he is and who he is. We'll take him and deal with him. And then you can all save yourself from crucifixion. You know what happened? Do you remember what happened in that famous scene? Right when Spartacus was about to stand up, he is actually standing up, and the guy that's chained next to him stands up and says, I am Spartacus. He wasn't Spartacus, but he said that he was Spartacus because he was not going to let Spartacus take his place. And then another guy stands up, and another guy stands up, and pretty soon you've got dozens and hundreds, all of the rest of those soldiers who had just lost a terrible battle, they all stand up and they're shouting, I am Spartacus. The many we're ready to take the punishment for the one. And that happens sometimes in, in, in human life too, doesn't it? One son or, or, or daughter doesn't want the little brother or the big brother to take the rap, so he says, I did it, I broke the lamp, whatever it is. At Jesus' baptism, Jesus does the opposite. Instead of the many taking the punishment, he says, I will take the punishment for the many. He stands up and says, I am the sinner. Punish me instead of them. And at the Jordan River, the sinless Son of God declares to the world that he was ready to start that journey to the cross to fulfill that punishment and to fulfill our redemption for you and for me. And on this day, when we celebrate the baptism of Jesus, it's a perfect opportunity to also celebrate our baptism and what it means for our daily lives. It's not here right now, and I wish we could have gotten it out past that tree, but the baptismal font is usually out there front and center. And you've seen it probably countless times when, when a young couple brings their baby, their newborn, up to the font and they gather around the font in a semicircle and they present their baby for baptism. And the pastor takes <clears throat> some water and pours it over the child's head and simply says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He says some more words. We have a couple of prayers. The family sits down. The baby might sleep through the whole thing. The baby might cry through the whole thing. But it takes all of five minutes for that simple ceremony to be carried out. It looks like nothing. It looks like really nothing happened except for the fact that the baby had some water poured over his or her head. Heaven is not opening like it did for Jesus' baptism. There's no voice from the skies coming down saying, This is my son. I love that son. I am pleased with that son or that daughter. It doesn't look like much as a baptism takes place in church. And yet, if you go through God's Word, and, and especially go through some of the passages that we read before, and take a look at what baptism is and what baptism does, what God says baptism does, you can't ever, ever say it looks like nothing, or it means nothing. And, and there are a lot of churches that really do believe that it really is not much. It's just a symbolic act by which we say that, yes, we are a Christian. No, it's much, much more than that. God comes to us. He washes away our sin. He plants the seed of faith in our hearts. He adopts us as one of his children. He gives us all the power that we need to fight against the devil and our sinful flesh every day of our lives. And he, through that promise, he gives us heaven itself and some people say it means nothing? Really? Your baptism means nothing? When God has all of these promises attached to baptism, Jesus' baptism reminds us of how he was coming to this world to fight for our souls. For the first 30 years of his life, he didn't seem like much of anybody. Born in Bethlehem, but there's not whole, a whole lot of people coming and finding who he is. Through the first 30 years of his life, Jesus is simply growing up in obscurity in the northern part of Galilee. But now, God says, it's time. For the next three years, you are going to show that you are Jesus. You're going to call your disciples. You're going to go to that cross and ultimately pay for the world's sins on that cross. That baptism reminds us of how Jesus was willing to fight for us. Every single one of us, not for our bodies, but for our souls. 
for our heaven. And that baptism also reminds us of our baptism, which connects us to Jesus' death and his resurrection. When God says to the world, this is my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. With you I am well pleased through what Jesus has accomplished in your place. It's a five-minute ceremony. I wish we had a baptism today and you would have been reminded of how simple it seems. A five-minute little ceremony. But that five-minute ceremony brings us blessings beyond compare. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Holy Lord, gracious Father, through your stern judgment, the unbelieving world was destroyed by the flood. But according to your great mercy, you saved Noah and his family. You engulfed stubborn Pharaoh and his army in the waters of the Red Sea, but let your people through those same waters to safety on dry land. In the waters of the Jordan, your own son was baptized and anointed with the Spirit. By these signs, you foreshadowed the precious cleansing bath which you give to us in holy baptism. Clinging to your command and promise, we ask that you would look with favor upon all of your baptized children. Set us apart from the unbelieving world and hold us safe and secure in the holy ark of your church. Keep us always fervent in spirit and joyful in hope, so that we may honor your holy name and at last receive the promised inheritance of eternal life 